Alrighty, welcome back to Free Read Fridays. I'm your intrepid, intrepid narrator, Fragath, and uh, today we're getting cracking on our next literary adventure, Authority by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, so, as is the way of Jeff Vandermeer, uh, it seems mo and I I haven't read all of the guy's library, but I have read a couple of his multi-book series, and um, let's just say that he has a habit of arranging things so there are always more questions than answers. Um, if you're down with that, you'll enjoy these. If you're not down with that, eh, probably not so much. <laughs> Um, I'm usually down with that, depending, um, if it feels like it's a deliberate intended choice by the author rather than just uh, writer incompetence. Um, and uh, in this case, it's very deliberate. Um, probably not a super long one this week um, because I got sort of jumped uh, by something that I totally forgot about at the last minute, just a couple of minutes ago. And I'm like, oh, okay, I've got to deal with that. So I will be dealing with that. But first, we'll do, uh, we'll do the reading. Oh, yeah, it probably helps if I actually show the cover that we're working with today. It's nice. It's sort of neutral. It's, um, uh, it's sort, of, sort of grassy stuff with... Um, with, uh, with uh, what could be blueberries or um, really anything. Um, this is the most neutral one I could find. All the rest have what could be construed as a meaty uh, plot spoiler. Um, and unfortunately, we are going to have to deal with showing some of those out of sequence, but it's fine. Um, I have enough to tide me over, hopefully until the event. I don't have that marked in my copy for when that actually is. Anyway, Authority, I think, is the longest book of the trilogy. Um, it actually might be outdone by the third book in the trilogy, because uh, Acceptance is rather long as well. It's it's probably on a par. Acceptance moves a bit more, uh, because it has more places to move. Um Oh yeah, what's what's our page count here? So authority is one. Call that one page one thirty two page. Call it three sixty. That's um. That's two hundred something pages. Whereas acceptance is that's what three sixty. Call it three seventy. Um, two page. It might be, yeah, acceptance I think is ever so slightly shorter, but not by much. Um, they're, they're about on a par, whereas the first book is only like, I don't know, 100, 130 pages or so, if that. It's pretty short. Uh, the first book is a romp. The second book is much more about building the existential dread. Um, and that's kind of, I think, the thing you need to come to peace with. Uh, as far as uh, book two is concerned, is it is authority is a complete and total slow burn. Like nothing happens <laughs> during a big chunk of the book. Uh, like you're introduced to stuff and it's all all new and interesting, and then like there's this big chunk of the middle where it's like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> Why? Where is where is this all going? And it's like, well, actually, he is slightly building towards something, just kind of to amp things up. Um, whether it's too long doing very little, I think I'll lead up to, I'll leave up to the, uh, the, uh, the listener, viewer, reader, whatever. Um, I think it's okay. Uh, I can understand why someone would be rather put off by it. Um, and then the ending is got a lot, like everything goes down in the ending. The ending is a, uh. Yikes. The ending is is a bit of a cluster. There's there's quite a lot that goes down. Quite a lot that goes down. Okay. Uh so with that said, let's get cracking because again my time is somewhat more limited than I would have liked. But Say lovey. All right, get yourself uh, 
get yourself comfortable or uncomfortable. Maybe you listen better that way. I don't know. People are weird. You know, you know, you know, you know. Um, I thought I tallied the number of new voices I'm going to have to do. Uh, but uh, I'm going to keep the protagonist kind of neutral because that's going to make my life easier. Grace is easy. Uh, Whitby is easy. Digby? I don't remember his name. He's an interesting character. Uh, the one I don't think I've come up with is one for the voice and the one for another character who will become relevant later. Alrighty, give me a sec. Oh, geez, everybody heard all of that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> oh, well. Me muttering about voices. <laughs> I'm not crazy. Authority by Jeff Vandermeer. Incantations. I guess part one would be. It's not labeled as such, but that's what it is. Zero, zero, zero. In Control's dreams, it is early morning, the sky deep blue with a twinge of light, with just a twinge of light. He is staring from a cliff down into an abyss, a bay, a cove. It always changes. He can see for miles into the still water. He can see ocean behemoths gliding there, like submarines or bell-shaped orchids or the wide hulls of ships, silent, ever-moving, the size of them conveying such a sense of power that he can feel the havoc of their passage even from so far above. He stares for hours at the shapes, the movements, listening to the whispers echoing up to him. And then he falls. Slowly, too slowly, he falls soundless into the dark water, without splash or ripple, and then keeps falling. Sometimes this happens while he is awake, as if he hasn't been paying enough attention, and then he silently recites his own name until the real world returns to him. Zero, zero, one. Falling. First day. The beginning of his last chance. These are the survivors. Control stood beside the assistant director of the Southern Reach, behind smudged one-way glass, staring at the three individuals sitting in the interrogation room. Returnees from the 12th expedition into Area X. The assistant director, a tall, thin, black woman in her forties, said nothing back, which didn't surprise Control. She hadn't wasted an extra word on him since he'd arrived that morning after taking Monday to get settled. She hadn't spared him an extra look, either, except when he'd told her and the rest of the staff to call him Control, not John or Rodriguez. She had paused a beat, then replied, In that case, call me Patience, not Grace, much to the stifled amusement of those present. The deflection away from her real name to one that also meant something else interested him. That's okay, he'd said. I can just call you Grace. I can just call you Grace. Certain this would not please her. She parried by continually referring to him as the acting director. Which was true. There lay between her stewardship and his ascension a gap, a valley of time and forms to be filled out, procedures to be followed, the rooting out and hiring of staff. Until then, the issue of authority might be murky. But Control preferred to think of her as neither patience nor grace. 
He preferred to think of her as an abstraction, if not an, obstru an obstruction. She had made him sit through an old orientation video about Area X, must have known it would be basic and out of date. She had already made clear that theirs would be a relationship based on animosity. From her side, at least. Where were they found? he asked her now, when what he wanted to ask was why they hadn't been kept separate from one another. Because you lack the discipline, because your department has been going to the rats for a long time now? The rats are down there in the basement now, gnawing away. Read the files, she said, making it clear he should have read them already. Then she walked out of the room. Leaving Control alone to contemplate the files on the table in front of him, and the three women behind the glass. Of course he had read the files, but he had hoped to duck past the assistant director's high guard, perhaps get her own thoughts. He'd read parts of her file, too, but still didn't have a sense of her except in terms of her reactions to him. His first full day was only four hours old, and he already felt contaminated by the dingy, bizarre building with its worn green carpet and the antiquated opinions of the other personnel he had met. That is a hard sentence to read. A sense of diminishment suffused everything, even the sunlight that half-heartedly pushed through the high, rectangular windows. He was wearing his usual black blazer and dress slacks, a white shirt with a light blue tie, black shoes he'd shined that morning. Now he wondered why he'd bothered. He disliked having such thoughts because he wasn't above it all. He was in it. But they were hard to suppress. Control took his time staring at the women, although their appearance told him little. They had all been given the same generic uniforms, vaguely army issue, but also vaguely janitorial. Their heads had all been shaved, as if they had suffered from some infestation, like lice, rather than something more inexplicable. Their faces all retained the same expression, or could be said not to retain any expression. Don't think of them by their names, he'd told himself on the plane. Let them carry only the weight of their functions at first. Then fill in the rest. But Control had never been good at remaining aloof. He liked to burrow in, try to find a level where the details illuminated without overwhelming him. The surveyor had been found at her house, sitting in a chair on the back patio. The anthropologist had been found by her husband, knocking on the back door of his medical practice. The biologist had been found in an overgrown lot several blocks from her house, staring at a crumbling brick wall. Just like the members of the prior expedition, none of them had any recollection of how they had made their way back across the invisible border, out of Area X. None of them knew how they had evaded the blockades and fences and other impediments the military had thrown up around the border. None of them knew what had happened to the fourth member of their expedition, the psychologist, who had, in fact, also been the director of the Southern Reach, and overridden all objections to lead them, incognito. None of them seemed to have much recollection of anything at all. And that should be a bit of a, a series of oh shit moments. In the cafeteria that morning for breakfast, Control had looked out through the wall-to-wall -wall paneled window into the courtyard with its profusion of stone tables, and then at the people shuffling through the line. Too few, it seemed, for such a large building. And asked Grace, why isn't everyone more excited to have the expedition back? She had given him a long-suffering look, as if he were a particularly slow student in, remedial, in a remedial class. "'Why do you think, Control?' 
She'd already managed to attach an ironic weight to his name, so he felt as if he were the sinker on one of his grandpa's fly rods, destined for the silt near the bottom of dozens of lakes. "'We went through all this with the last expedition. They endured nine months of questions, and yet we never found out anything. And the whole time they were dying. How would that make you feel?' Long months of disorientation, and then their deaths from a particularly malign form of cancer. He'd nodded slowly in response. Of course, she was right. His father had died of cancer. He hadn't thought of how that might have affected the staff. To him, it was still an abstraction, just words in a report read on the plane down. Here, in the cafeteria, the carpet turned dark green against which a stylized arrow pattern stood out in a light green, in a light green, all of the arrows pointing toward the courtyard. "'Why isn't there more light in here?' he asked. "'Where does all the light go?' But Grace was done answering his questions for the moment. When one of the three, the biologist, turned her head a fraction, looking into the glass as if she could see him, Control evaded that stare with a kind of late-blooming embarrassment. Scrutiny such as his was impersonal, professional, but it probably didn't feel that way, even though they knew they were being watched. He hadn't been told he would spend his first day questioning disoriented re returnees from Area X, and yet Central must have known when he'd, been when he'd been offered the position. The expedition members had been picked up almost six weeks ago, been subjected to a month of tests at a processing station up north, before being sent to the Southern Reach. That's with a capital S and a capital R. Just as he'd been sent out to Central first to endure two weeks of briefings, including gaps, whole days that slid into oblivion without much of anything happening, as if they'd always meant to time it this way. Then everything had sped up, and he had been given the impression of urgency. These were among the details that had caused a kind of futile exasperation to wash over him ever since his arrival. The voice, his primary contact in the upper echelons, had implied in an initial briefing that this was an easy assignment, given his past history. The Southern Reach had become a backward, backwater agency, guarding a dormant secret that no one seemed to care much about anymore, given the focus on terrorism and ecological collapse. The voice had, in its gruff way, typified his mission to start as being brought in to acclimate, assess, analyze, and then dig in deep, which wasn't his usual brief these days. During an admittedly up-and-down career, Control had started as an operative in the field, surveillance on domestic terror cells. Then he'd been bumped up to data synthesis and organizational analysis, two dozen or more cases, banal in their similarities, and about which he was forbidden to talk. Cases invisible to the public, the secret history of nothing. But more and more he had become the fixer, mostly because he seemed better at identifying other people's specific problems than at managing his own general ones. At thirty-eight, that was what he had become known for, if he was known for anything. It meant you didn't have to be there for the duration, even though by now that's exactly what he wanted, to see something through. Problem was, no one really liked a fixer. Hey, let me show you what you're doing wrong! Especially if they thought the fixer needed fixing from way back. It always started well, even though it didn't always end well. The voice had also neglected to mention that Area X lay beyond a border that still, after more than thirty years, no one seemed to understand. 
No, he'd only picked up on that when reviewing the files and in the needless replication from the orientation video. Nor had he known that the assistant director would hate him so much for replacing the missing director. Although he should have guessed, according to the scraps of information in her file, she had grown up lower middle class, had gone to public school at first, had had to work harder than most to get her to her current position. While control came with whispers about being part of a kind of invisible dynasty, which naturally bred resentment. There was no denying that fact, even if, up close, the dynasty was more like a devolving franchise. They're ready. Come with me. Grace conjured up again, commanding him from the doorway. There were, he knew, several different ways to break down a colleague's opposition, or their will. He would probably have to try all of them. Control picked up two of the three files from the table, and, gaze now locked in on the biologist, tore them down the middle, feeling the torque in his palms, and let them fall into the wastebasket. A kind of choking sound came from behind him. Now he turned, right into the full force of the assistant director's wordless anger. But he could see a wariness in her eyes, too. Good. Why are you still keeping paper files, Grace? He asked, taping a taking a step forward. The director insisted. You did that for a reason? He ignored her. Grace, why are none of you comfortable using the words alien or extraterrestrial to talk about Area X? He wasn't comfortable with them, either. He wasn't comfortable with them either. Sometimes, since he'd been briefed on the truth, he'd felt a great, empty chasm opening up inside of him, filled with his own screams and yelps of disbelief. But he'd never tell. He had a face for playing poker. He'd, uh, he'd been told this by lovers and by relatives, even by strangers. About six feet tall. Impassive. The compact, muscular build of an athlete. He could run for miles and not feel it. He took pride in a good diet and enough exercise, although he did like whiskey. She stood her ground. No one's sure. Never prejudge the evidence. Even after all this time, I only need to interview one of them. What? she asked. Torque in his hands transformed into torque in conversation. I don't need the other files, because I only need to question one of them. You need all three. As if she still didn't quite understand. He swiveled to pick up the remaining file. No, just the biologist. That is a mistake. 753 isn't a mistake, he said. 722 isn't a mistake, either. Her eyes narrowed. Something is wrong with you. Keep the biologist in there, he said, ignoring her but adopting her syntax. I know something you don't. Send the others back to their quarters. Grace stared at him as if he were some kind of rodent and she couldn't decide whether to be disgusted or pitying. After a moment, though, she nodded stiffly and left. He relaxed, let out his breath. Although she had to accept his orders, she still controlled the staff for the next week or two, could check him in a thousand ways until he was fully embedded. Was it alchemy or a true magic? Was he wrong? And did it matter, since if he was wrong, each was exactly like the others anyway? Yes, it mattered. This was his last chance. His mother had told him so before he'd come.
Control's mother often seemed to him like a flash of light across a distant night sky. Here and gone, gone and here, and always remembered. People perhaps wondered what it had been, what had caused the light. But you couldn't truly know it. An only child, Jackie Severance, had followed her father into the service and excelled. Now she operated at levels far above anything her father, Jack Severance, had achieved, and he had been a much decorated agent. Jack had brought her up sharp, organized, ready to lead. For all control knew, Grandpa had made Jackie do tire obstacle courses as a child, stab flower sacks with bayonets. There weren't a whole lot of family albums from which to verify. Whatever the process, he had also bred into her a kind of casual cruelty, an expectation of high performance, and a calculated quality that could manifest as seeming indifference to the fate of others. As a distant flash of light, Control admired her fiercely, had, indeed, followed her, if at a much lower altitude. But as a parent, even when she was around, she was unreliable about picking him up from school on time, or remembering his lunches, or helping with homework. Rarely consistent on much of anything important in the mundane world on this side of the divide. Although she had always encouraged him in his headlong flight into and through the service. Grandpa Jack, on the other hand, had never seemed fond of the idea, had one day looked at him and said, I don't think he has the temperament. That assessment had been devastating to a boy of sixteen, already set on that course, but then it made him more determined, more focused, more tilted skyward toward the light. Later, he thought that might have been why Grandpa has, had said it. Grandpa had a kind of unpredictable wildfire side, while his mother was an icy blue flame. When he was eight or nine, they'd gone up to the summer cottage by the lake for the first time. Our own private spy club, his mother had called it. Just him, his mother, and Grandpa. There was an old TV in the corner, opposite the tattered couch. Grandpa would make him move the antenna to get better reception. Just a little to the left, Control, he'd say. Just a little more. His mother in the other room, going over some declassified files she'd brought from the office. And, he'd, and so he'd gotten his nickname, not knowing Grandpa had stolen it from spy jargon. As that kid, he'd held that nickname close as something cool, something his Grandpa had given him out of love. But he was still astute enough not to tell anyone outside of family, even his girlfriends, for many years. He'd let them think that it was a sports nickname from high school, where he'd been a backup quarterback. When he grew up, he took control for his own. He could feel the sting of condescension in the word by then, but would never ask Grandpa if he'd meant it that way, or some other way. Wondered if the fact he'd spent as much time reading in the cottage by the lake as fishing had somehow turned his grandfather against him. So, yes, he'd taken the name, remade it, and let it stick. But this was the first time he'd told his co-workers to call him Control, and he couldn't say why, really. It had just come to him, as if he could somehow gain a true, fresh start. A little to the left, Control, and maybe you'll pick up that flash of light. Why an empty lot? This he'd wondered ever since seeing the surveillance tape earlier that morning. Why had the biologist returned to an empty lot rather than her house? The other two had returned to something personal, to a place that held an emotional attachment. 
But the biologist had stood for hours and hours in an overgrown lot, oblivious to anything around her. From watching so many suspects on videotape, contro Control had become adroit at, at picking up even picking up on even the most mundane mannerism or nervous tick that meant a signal was being passed on. But there was nothing like that on the tape. Her presence there had registered with the Southern Reach via a report filed by the local police, who'd picked her up as a vagrant. A delayed reaction, driven by, the ac driven by active searching once the Southern Reach had picked up the other two. Then there was the issue of terseness versus terseness. 753. 722. A slim lead, but Control already sensed that this assignment hinged on the details, on detective work. Nothing would come easy. He'd have no luck, no shit-for-brains amateur bomb-maker armed with fertilizer and some cut-rate version of an ideology who went to pieces within twenty minutes of being put in the interrogation room. During the preliminary interviews, before it was determined who went on the twelfth expedition, the biologist had, according to the transcripts in her file, managed to divulge only 753 words. Control had counted them. That included the word breakfast as a complete answer to one question. Control admired that response. He had counted and recounted the words during that drawn-out period of waiting while they set up his computer, issued him a security card, presented to him passwords and key codes, and went through all of the other rituals which he, which he had become overly familiar during his passage through various agencies and departments. He'd insisted on the former director's office, despite Grace's attempts to, corner, to cordon him off in a glorified broom closet, well away from the heart of everything. He'd also insisted they leave everything as is in the office, even personal items. She clearly disliked the idea of him rummaging through the director's things. You are a little off, Grace had said when the others had left. You are not all there. He'd just nodded because there was no use denying it was a little strange. But if he were, but if he was here to assess and restore, he needed a better idea of how badly it had all slipped. And as some sociopath at another station had once said, the fish rots from the head. Fish rotted all over, cell corruption being non-hierarchical and not caste-driven, but point taken. Control had immediately taken a seat behind the battering ram of a desk, among the clutter of piles and piles of folders, the ramble of handwritten notes and post-its. In the swivel chair that gave him such a great panoramic view of the bookcases against the walls, interspersed with bulletin boards, overlaid with the sediment of various bits of paper pinned and repinned, until they looked more like oddly delicate yet haphazard art installations. The room smelled stale, with with a slight aftertaste of long-ago cigarettes. Just the size and weight of the director's computer monitor spoke to its obsolescence, as did the fact that it had died decades ago, thick dust layered atop it. It had been half-heartedly shoved to the side, two shroud shadows on the calendar blotter beneath, describing both its original location and the location of the laptop that had apparently supplanted it, although no one could, could now find that laptop. He made a mental note to ask if they had searched her home. The calendar dated back to the late 90s. Was that when the director had started to lose the thread? He had a sudden vision of her in Area X with the Twelfth Expedition, just wandering through the wilderness with no real destination, a tall, husky, forty-year-old woman who looked older. Silent, conflicted, torn. So devoured by her responsibility that she'd allowed herself to believe she owed it to the people she sent into the field to join them. 
Why had no one stopped her? Had no one cared about her? Had she made a convincing case? The voice hadn't said. The maddeningly incomplete files on her told Control nothing. Everything in what he saw showed that she had cared, and yet that she had cared not at all about the functioning of the agency. Nudging his knee on the left, under the desk, the hard drive for the monitor. He wondered if that had stopped working back in the 90s, too. Control had the feeling he did not want to see the rooms the hardware techs worked in, the miserable, languishing corpses of the computers of past decades, the chaotic, unintentional museum of plastic and wires and circuit boards. Or perhaps the fish did rot from the head, and only the director had decomposed. So... Sans computer, his own laptop not yet deemed secure enough, Control had done a little light reading of the transcripts from the induction interviews with the members of the twelfth of the twelfth expedition. The former director, in her role as psychologist, had conducted them. The other recruits had been uncapable, unstoppable geysers, in Control's opinion. Great, chortling, hurtling, cliché-spouting babblers. People who, by comparison, could not hold their tongues. 4,623 words. 7,154 words. And the all-time champion, the linguist who had blacked out at the last second, coming in at 12,743 words of replies, including a heroically prolonged childhood memory, about as entertaining as a kidney stone exploding through your dick, as someone had scrawled in the margin. Which just left the biologist and her terse 753 words. That kind of self-control had made him look not just at the words, but at the pauses between them. For example, I enjoyed all of my jobs in the field, yet she had been fired from most of them. She thought she had said nothing, but every word, even breakfast, created an opening. Breakfast had not gone well for the biologist as a child. The ghost was right there, in the transcript since her return, moving through the text. Things that showed themselves in the empty spaces, making Control unwilling to say her words aloud, for fear that somehow that he, somehow he did not really understand the undercurrents and hidden references. A detached description of a thistle. A mention of a lighthouse. A sentence or two describing the quality of the light on the marshes in Area X. None of it should have gotten to him, yet he felt her there, somehow, looking over his shoulder in a way not evoked... in a way not evoked by the interviews with the other expedition members. The biologist claimed to remember as little as the others. Control knew that for a lie. Or it would become a lie if he drew her out. Did he want to draw her out? Was she cautious because something had happened in Area X, or because she was built that way? A shadow had passed over the director's desk then. He'd been here before, or somewhere close, making these kinds of decisions before, and it had almost broken him, or broken through him. But he had no choice. About seven hundred words after she came back, just like the other two. But unlike them, that was roughly comparable to her terseness before she had left. And there were the odd specifics that the others lacked. Whereas the anthropologist might say, The wilderness was empty and pristine. The biologist, oh wait, the anthropologist, what did the anthropologist say? I don't remember what the anthropologists sound like. They died so early. The, the wilderness was empty and pristine. The biologist said, There were bright pink thistles everywhere, even when the fresh water shifted to, to saline. The light at dusk was a low blaze, a brightness. 
That, combined with the strangeness of the empty lot, made Control believe that the biologist might actually remember more than the others. That she might be more present than the others, but was hiding it for some reason. He'd never had this particular situation before, but he remembered a colleague's questioning of a terrorist who had suffered a head wound and spent the interrogation sessions in the hospital delaying and delaying in hopes his memory would return. It had. But only the facts, not the righteous impulse that had engendered his action. And then he'd been lost, easy prey for the questioners. I don't think amnesia works that way. Control hadn't shared his theory with the assistant director, because if he was wrong, she'd use it to shore up her negative opinion of him, but also to keep her off balance for as long as possible. Never do something for just one reason, his grandpa had told him more than once, and that, at least, Control had taken to heart. The biologist's hair had been long and dark brown, almost black, before they'd shaved it off. She had dark, thick eyebrows, green eyes, a slight, slightly off-center nose, broken once, falling on rocks, and high cheekbones that spoke to the strong Asian heritage on one side of her family. Her chapped lips were surprisingly full for such a thin frown. He mistrusted the eyes, the percentages on that, had checked to confirm they hadn't been another color before the expedition. Even sitting down at the table, she somehow projected a sense of being physically strong, with a ridge of thick muscle where her neck met her shoulders. So far, all the tests run had come back negative for cancer or other abnormalities. He couldn't remember what it said in her file, but Control thought she was probably almost as tall as him. She had been held in the eastern wing of the building for two weeks now, with nothing to do but eat and exercise. Before going on the expedition, the biologist had received intense survival and weapons training at a central facility devoted to that purpose, Central with a capital C. She would have been briefed with whatever half-truths the Southern Reach's command and control deemed useful, based on criteria control still found arcane, even murky. She would have been subjected to conditioning to make her more receptive to hypnotic suggestion. The psychologist-slash-director would have been given any number of hypnotic cues to use, words that, in certain combinations, would induce certain effects. Passing thought... Passing thought as the door shut behind control. Had the director had anything to do with muddying their memories while they were still in Area X? Control slid into a chair across from the biologist, aware that Grace, at the very least, watched them through the one-way glass. Experts had questioned the biologist, but Control was also a kind of expert, and he needed to have the direct contact. There was something in the texture of a face-to-face -face interview that transcripts and videotape lacked. The floor beneath his shoes was grimy, almost sticky. The fluorescent lights above flickered at irregular intervals, and the table and chairs seemed like something out of a high school cafeteria. He could smell the sour, metallic tang of low-quality cleaning agent, almost like rotting honey. The room did not inspire confidence in the Southern Reach. A room meant as a debriefing space, or meant to seem like a debriefing space, should be more comfortable than one meant always and forever for interrogation, for a presumption of possible resistance. Now that Control sat across from the biologist, she had the kind of presence that made him reluctant to stare into her eyes. 
But he always felt nervous right before he questioned someone, always felt as if that bright flash of light across the sky had frozen in its progress and come down to stand at his shoulder, mother in the flesh, observing him. The truth of it was, his mother did check up on him sometimes. She could get hold of the footage. So it wasn't paranoia or just a feeling. It was part of his possible reality. Sometimes it helped to play up his nervousness, to make the person across from him relax. So he cleared his throat, took a hesitant sip of water from the glass he'd brought in with him, fiddled with the file on her he'd placed on the table between them, along with a remote control for the TV to his left. To preserve the conditions under which he, she'd been found, to basically ensure she didn't gain memories artificially, the assistant director had ordered that she not be given any of the information from her personnel file. Control found this cruel, but agreed with Grace. He wanted the file between them to seem like a possible reward during some later session, even if he didn't yet know if he would give it to her. Control introduced himself by his real name, informed her that their interview was being recorded, and asked her to state her name for the record. "'Call me Ghostbird,' she said. Was there a twinge of defiance in her flat voice? He looked up at her and instantly was at sea, looked away again. Was she using hypnotic suggestion on him somehow? It was his first thought, quickly dismissed. Ghostbird? Or nothing at all? He nodded, knew when to let something go, would research the term later. Vaguely remembered something in the file. Perhaps. Ghostbird, he said, testing it out. The words tasted chalky, unnatural in his mouth. You remember nothing about the expedition? I told the others it was a pristine wilderness. He thought he detected a note of irony in her tone, but couldn't be sure. How well did you get to know the linguist uh, during training? he asked. Not very well. She was very vocal. She wouldn't shut up. She was... The biologist trailed off as control stifled elation. A question she hadn't expected. Not at all. She was what? he prompted. The prior interrogator had used the standard technique, develop rapport, present the facts, grow the relationship from there, with nothing, really, to show for it. I don't remember. I think you do remember. And if you remember that, then... No. He made a show of opening the file and consulting the existing transcripts, letting the edge of the paper-clipped pages that gave her most vital statistics come clear. Okay, then. Tell me about the thistles. The thistles? Her expressive eyebrows told him what she thought of the question. Yes, you were quite specific about the thistles. Why? It still perplexed him, the amount of detail there about thistles, in an interview from the prior week, when she'd arrived at the Southern Reach. It made him think again of hypnotic cues. It made him think of words being used as a protective thicket. The biologist shrugged. I don't know. He read from the transcript. The thistles there have a lavender bloom and grow in the transitional space between the forest and the swamp. You cannot avoid them. They attract a variety of insects, and the buzzing and the brightness that surrounds them suffuses Area X with a sense of industry, almost like a human city. And it goes on, although I won't. She shrugged again. Control didn't intend to hover, this first time, but instead to glide over the terrain, to map out the extent of the territory he wanted to cover with her. So he moved on. What do you remember about your husband? How is that relevant? Relevant to what? Pouncing. No response, so he prompted her again. What do you remember about your husband? That I had one. Some memories before I went over, like I had about the linguist. Clever to tie that in, to try to make it seem part and parcel. 
a vagueness, not a sharpness. Did you know that he came back like you? he asked. That he was disoriented like you? I'm not disoriented, she snapped, leaning forward, and Control leaned, leaned back. He wasn't afraid, but for a moment he'd thought he, he'd thought he should be. Brain scans had been normal. All measures had been taken to check for anything remotely like an invasive species. Or an intruder, as Grace had put it, still unable to say anything to him remotely like the word alien. If anything, Ghostbird was healthier now than before she'd left. The toxins present in most people today existed in her and other and the others at much lower levels than normal. I didn't mean to offend, he said. And yet she was disoriented, Control knew. No matter what she remembered or didn't remember, the biologist he'd come to know from the pre-expedition transcripts would not have so quickly shown irritation. Why had he gotten to her? He picked up the remote control from beside the file, clicked twice. The flat-screen TV on the wall to their left fizzled to life, showing the pixelated, fuzzy image of the biologist standing in the empty lot, almost as still as the pavement or the bricks in the building in front of her. The whole scene was awash in the sickly green of surveillance camera noir. Why that empty lot? Why did we find you there? A look of indifference and no answer. He let the video continue to play. The repetition in the background sometimes got to the interviewee. But usually, the video footage showed a suspect putting down a bag or shoving something into a trash bin. First day in Area X, Control said, hiking to base camp. What happened? Nothing much. Control had no children, but he imagined that this was more or less what he'd get from a teenager asked about her day at school. Perhaps he would circle back for a moment. But you remember the thistles very, very well, he said. I don't know why you keep talking about the thistles. Because what you said about them suggests you remember some of your observations from the expedition. A pause, and Control knew the biologist was staring at him. He wanted to return fire, but something warned him against it. Something made him feel that the dream of falling into the depths might take him. Oh, wait. Something made him feel that the dream of falling into the depths might take him. Might. Hmm. I'm getting the emphasis on that wrong, but I know what it sounds like in my head. Why am I a prisoner here? she asked and he felt it was safe to meet her gaze again, as if some moment of danger had come and gone. You aren't. This is part of your debriefing. But I can't leave. Not yet, he admitted, but you will. If only to another facility. It might be another two or three years, if all went well, before they allowed any of the returnees back out into the world. Their legal status was in that gray area often arbitrarily defined by the threat to national security. I find that unlikely, she said. He decided to try again. If not thistles, what would be relevant, he asked. What should I ask you? Isn't that your job? What is my job? Although he knew perfectly well what she meant. You're in charge of the Southern Reach. Do you know what the Southern Reach is? Yes. Like a hiss. What about the second day at base camp? When did things begin to get strange? Had they? He had to assume they had. I don't remember. Control leaned forward. I can put you under hypnosis. I have the right to. I can do that. Hypnosis doesn't work on me, she said, disgust at his threat from disgust at his threat clear from her tone. How do you know? A moment of disorientation. Had she given up something she didn't want to give up? Or had she remembered something lost to her before? Did she know the difference? I just know. For clarity on that, we could recondition you and then put you under hypnosis. 
All of this a bluff, in that it was more complicated logistically. To do so, Control would have to send her to Central, and she'd disappear into that maw forever. He might get to see the reports, but he'd never have direct contact again. Nor did he particularly want to recondition her. Do that and I'll... She managed to stop herself on the cusp of what sounded like the beginning of the word kill. Control decided to ignore that. He'd been on the other end of enough threats to know which to, st to, know which to take seriously. What made you resistant to hypnosis? he asked. Are you resistant to hypnosis? Defiant. Why were you at the empty lot? The other two were found looking for their loved ones. No reply. Maybe enough had been said for now. Maybe this was enough. Control turned off the television, picked up his file, nodded at her, and walked out the door. Walked to the door. Once there, the door open and letting in what seemed like more shadows than it should, he turned, aware of the assistant director staring at him from down the hall as he looked back at the biologist. He asked, as he had always planned to, the postscript to an opening act. What's the last thing you remember doing in Area X? The answer, unexpected, surged up toward him like a kind of attack as the light met the darkness. Drowning. I was drowning. Ooh. Spooky. Zero, zero, 002 Adjustments Just close your eyes and you will remember me, Control's father had told him just three years ago, in a place not far from where he was now, the dying trying to comfort the living. The dying trying to comfort the living. But when he closed his eyes, everything d disappeared except the dream of falling and the accumulated scars from past assignments. Why had the biologist said that? Why had she said she was drowning? It had thrown him, but it had also given him an odd sense of secret sharing between them. As if she had gotten into his head and seen his dream, and now they were bound together. He resented that, did not want to be connected to the people he had to question. He had to glide above. He had to choose when he swooped down, not to be brought to earth by the will of another. Not be brought to earth by the will of another. When Control opened his eyes, he was standing in the back of the U-shaped building that served as the Southern Reach's headquarters. The curve lay in the front, a road and parking lot preceding it. Built in a style now decades old, the layered, stacked concrete was a monument or a midden. He couldn't decide which. The ridges and clefts were baffling. The way the roof leered slightly over the rest made it seem less functional than like a less functional than like a performance art or abstract sculpture on a grand and yet numbing scale. Making things worse, the area coveted the area coveted by the open arms of the U had been made into a courtyard, looking out on a lake ringed by thick, old-growth forest. The edges of the lake were singed black, as if at one time set ablaze, and a wretched gnarl of cypress trees waded through the dark, brackish water. The light that suffused the lake had a claustrophobic gray quality, separate and distinct from the blue sky above.
This, too, had at one time been new, perhaps back during the Cretaceous period, and the building had probably stood here in the, had probably stood here then in some form, reverse-engineered so far into the past that you could still look out the windows and see dragonflies as big as vultures. The you that hugged them close inspired no great confidence. It felt less a symbol of luck than of the incomplete. Incomplete thoughts. Incomplete conclusions. Incomplete reports. The doors at the ends of the U, through which many passed as a shortcut to the other side, confirmed a failure of imagination. Confirmed a failure of the imagination. And all the while, the abysmal swamp did whatever swamps did, as perfect in its way as the southern reach was imperfect. Everything was so still that when a woodpecker swooped across the scene, it was as violent as the sonic boom of an F-16. Oh, hey, that rhymes. To the left of the U and the lake, just visible from where he stood, a road threaded its way through the trees, toward the invisible border, beyond which lay Area X. Just thirty-five miles of paved road, and then another fifteen unpaved beyond that, with ten choke points in all, and shoot-to-kill orders if you weren't meant to be there, and fences, and barbed wire, and trenches, and pits, and more swamp, possibly even government-trained colonies of apex predators, and genetically modified poison berries, and hammers to hit yourself on the head with. But in some ways, ever since Control had been briefed, he had wondered. To what point? Because that's what you did in such situations? Keep people out? He'd studied the reports. If you reached the border in an unauthorized way, and crossed over anywhere but the door, you would never be seen again. How many people had done just that without being spotted? How would the Southern Reach ever know? Once or twice, an investigative journalist had gotten close enough to photograph the outside of Southern Reach's border facilities. But even then, it had just confirmed in the public imagination the official story of environmental catastrophe, one that wouldn't be cleaned up for a century. There came a tread around the stone tables in the concrete courtyard, across which little white tiles competed with squares of clotted earth, into which unlikely tulips had been shoved at irregular intervals. He knew that tread, with its special extra little dragging sound. The assistant director had been a field officer once. Something had happened on assignment, and she'd hurt her leg. Inside the building she could disguise it, but not on the treacherous, grouted tiles. It wasn't an advantage for him to know this, because it made him want to empathize with her. Whenever you say, in the field, I have this image of all you spooks running through the wheat, his father had said to his mother once. Grace was joining him at his request to assist him in staring out at the swamp while they talked about Area X. Because he'd thought a change of setting, leaving the confines of the concrete coffin, might help soften her animosity. Before he'd realized just how truly hellish and prehistoric the landscape was, and thus, how, and thus now prehysterical as well. Look out upon this mosquito orgy, and warm to me, Grace. You interviewed the biologist. I still do not know why. She said this before he could extend even a tendril of an opening gambit. And all of his resolve to play the diplomat, to somehow become her colleague, not her enemy, even if by misdirection or a metaphorical jab in the kidneys, dissolved into the humid air. He explained his thought processes. She seemed impressed, although he couldn't really read her yet. Did she ever seem, during training, like she was hiding something? He asked. Deflection. You think she is hiding something? I don't know yet, actually. I could be wrong. We have more expert interrogators than you. Probably true. We should send her to Central. The thought made him shudder. No. 
he said, a little too emphatically, then worried in the next split second that the assistant director might guess that he cared about the biologist's fate. I have already sent the anthropologist and the surveyor away. Now he could smell the decay of all that plant matter, slowly rotting beneath the surface of the swamp, could sense the awkward turtles and the stunted fish pushing their way through matted layers. He didn't trust himself to turn to face her, didn't trust himself to say anything, stood there suspended by his surprise. Cheerfully, she continued, You said they weren't of any use, so I sent them to Central. By whose authority? Your authority. You clearly indicated to me that this was what you wanted. If you meant something else, my apologies. A tiny seismic shift occurred inside of Control, an imperceptible shudder. They were gone. He couldn't have them back. He had to put it out of his mind, would feed himself the lie that Grace had done him a favor, simplified his job. Just how much pull did she have at Central, anyway? "'I can always read the transcripts if I change my mind,' he said, attempting an agreeable tone. They'd still be questioned, and he'd given her the opening by saying he didn't want to interview them. She was scanning his face intently, looking for some sign that she'd come close to hitting the target. He tried to smile, doused his anger with the thought that if the assistant director had meant him real harm, she would have found a way to spirit the biologist away, too. This was just a warning. Now, though, he was going to have to take something away from Grace as well. Not to get even, but so she wouldn't be tempted to take yet more from him. He couldn't afford to lose the biologist, too. Not yet. Into the awkward silence, Grace asked, Why are you just standing out here in the heat like an idiot? Breezily, as if nothing had happened at all, We should go inside. It's time for lunch, and you can meet some of the admin. Control was already growing accustomed to her disrespect of him, and he hated that, wanted an opportunity to reverse the trend. As he followed her in, the swamp at his back had a weight, a presence. Another kind of enemy. He'd had enough of such views, growing up nearby as a teenager after his parents' divorce, and, again, while his father slowly died. He'd hoped to never see a swamp again. Just close your eyes and you will remember me. I do, Dad. I do remember you, but you're fading. There's too much interference, and all of this is becoming much too real. Control's father's side of the family came originally from Central America, Hispanic and Indian. He had his father's hands and black hair, his mother's slight nose and height, a skin color somewhere in between. His paternal grandfather had died before Control was old enough to know him, but he had heard the epic stories. The man had sold clothespins door to door as a kid, in certain neighborhoods, and had been a boxer in his twenties, not good enough to be a contender, but good enough to be a paid opponent and take a beating. Afterward, he'd been a construction worker, and then a driving instructor, before an early death from a heart attack at sixty-five. His wife, who worked at a bakery, passed on just a year later. His eldest child, Control's father, had grown up to be an artist in a family mostly composed of carpenters and mechanics, and used his heritage to create abstract sculptures. He had humanized the abstractions by painting over them in the bright palette favored by the Mayans, and, and affixing to them bits of tile and glass, bridging some gap between professional and outsider art. That was his life, and Control never knew a time that his father was not that person, and only that person. 
The story of how Control's father and mother fell in love was also the happy story of how his father had risen, for a time, as a favorite in high-end art galleries. They had met at a reception for his work, and, as they told it, had been enamored with each other right from the first glance, although later Control found that difficult to believe. At the time, she was based up north, and had what amounted to a desk job, although she was rising fast. His father moved to be with her, and they had control, and then only a year or two later she was reassigned, from a desk job to active duty in the field. And that was the start of the end of it all, the story that anchored control as a kid soon revealed as just a brief moment set against a landscape of unhappiness. Not unique. A kind of depressingly familiar painting you'd find in a seaside antique store, but never buy. The silence was punctuated by arguments, a silence created not just by the secrets she carried with she car <laughs> a silence created not just by the secrets she carried with her, but by those she could not divulge, and, control realized as an adult, by her inner reserve, which after a time could not be bridged. Her absences tore at his father, and by the time Control was ten, that was the subtext and sometimes the transcript of their dispute. She was killing his art, and that wasn't fair, even though the art scene had moved on, and what his father did was expensive and required patrons, or grants, to sustain. She bore the recrimination, Control remembered, with Control... with... <sighs> She bore the recrimination, Control remembered, with calm and a chilly, aloof compassion. She was the unstoppable force that came blowing in, not there, there, not there, there, with presents bought at the last minute in far-off airports and an innocent-sounding cover story about what she'd been up to, or a less innocent story that Control realized years later, when faced with a similar dilemma, had been coming to them from a time delay. Something declassified she could now share, but that had happened, but that had happened to her long ago. But that had happened to her long ago. There we go. We can get cadences. These sentences, for the record, are tough. Um, Jeff Vandermeer is not the easiest author to read. The stories and the aloofness agitated his father, but the compassion infuriated him. When they divorced, Control went south to live with his dad, who became embedded in a community that felt comfortable because it included some of his relatives, and fed his artistic ambitions even as his bank account starved. Yet during those hot summers in that small town not very far from the southern reach, as a thirteen-year-old with a rusty bike and a few loyal friends, Control kept thinking about his mother out in the field, in some far-off city or country. That distant streak of light that sometimes came down out of the night sky and materialized on their doorstep as a human being. Exactly in the same way as when they'd been together as a family. One day, he believed, she would take him with her, and he would become the streak of light, have secrets that no one else could ever know. Some rumors about Area X were elaborate, and in their complexity seemed to control like schools of the most deadly and yet voluminous jellyfish at the aquarium. As you watched them, in their undulating progress, they seemed both real and unreal, framed against the stark blue of the water. Invasion site. Secret government experiments. How could such an organism actually exist? The simple ones that echoed the official story, variations on a human-made ecological disaster area, were by contrast so commonplace these days that they hardly registered or elicited curiosity. The petting zoo ver versions that ate out of your hand. But the truth did have a simple quality to it. About 32 years ago, along a remote southern stretch known by some as the Forgotten 
Coast, an event with a capital E had occurred that began to transform the landscape and simultaneously caused a border or wall to appear. A kind of ghost or permeable pre-border manifestation, as the files put it, light as fog, almost invisible except for a flickering quality, had quickly emanated out in all directions from an unknown epicenter and then suddenly stopped at its current impenetrable limits. Since then, the southern reach had been established and sought to investigate what had occurred, with little success and much sacrifice of lives via the expeditions, sent in through the sole point of egress. Wouldn't that be ingress? I guess it's where things can leave. Whatever. Yet that loss of life was trifling compared to the possibility of some break in containment across a border that the scientists were still studying and trying to understand. The riddle of why... Uh, the riddle of why equipment, when recovered, had been rendered non-functional, some of it decomposing at an incredibly fast rate. The teasing, inconsistent way in which some expeditions came back entirely unharmed that seemed almost inexplicable. It started earlier than the border coming down, the assistant director told him after, the lu after lunch in his new old office. She was all business now, and Control chose to accept her at face value, to continue to put away, for now, his anger at her preemptive strike in banishing the anthropologist and the surveyor. Grace rolled out the map of Area X on a corner of his desk. The coastline, the lighthouse, the base camp, the trails, the lakes and rivers, the island many miles north that marked the farthest reach of the... incursion? Invasion? Infestation? What word worked? The worst part of the map was the black dot... was the black dot hand-labeled by the director as... the tunnel but known to most as the topographical anomaly. Worst part, because not every expedition whose members had survived to report back had encountered it, even when they'd mapped the same area. Grace tossed files on top of the map. It still struck control, with a kind of nostalgia rarely granted to his generation, how anachronistic it was to deal in paper. But the concern about sending modern technology across the border had infected the former director. She had forbidden certain forms of communication, required that all emails be printed out and the original, electronic versions, regularly archived and purged, and had arcane and confusing protocols for using the Internet and other forms of electronic communication. Would he put an end to that? He didn't know yet, had a kind of sympathy for the policy, impractical though it might be. He used the internet solely for research and admin. He believed a kind of a fragmentation had crept into people's minds in the modern era. He's right. It started earlier. How much earlier? Intel dictates that there may have been odd... Activity occurring along the, that coast for at least a century before the border came down, before Area X had formed. A pristine wilderness. He'd never heard the word pristine used so many times before today. Idly, he wondered what they called it, whoever or whatever had created that pristine bubble that had killed so many people. Maybe they called it a holiday retreat. Maybe they called it a beachhead. Maybe they were so incomprehensible he'd never understand what they called it or why. He'd asked the voice if he needed access to the files on other major unexplained occurrences, and the voice had said, had made no sound. <laughs> Sorry, let's try that portion of the sentence. And the voice, let's try the entire sentence from the top. Give me a sec. I'm sorry. They're a combination of, like, run-on sentences and lots of actual data <laughs> in the sentences. Well, contextual data. 
He'd asked the voice if he needed access to the files on other major unexplained occurrences, and the voice had made no sound like a granite cliff with only flailing blue sky beyond it. Control had already seen at least some of the flotsam and jetsam now threatening to buckle the desk in the file summary. He knew that quite a bit of the information peeking out at him from the beige folders came from lighthouse journals and police records, and that the inexplicable in it had to be teased out from the edges, pushed forward into the light like the last bit of toothpaste in the dehydrated tube curled, on the, curled up on the edge of the bathroom sink. The kind of strange doings alluded to by hard-living bearded fishermen in old horror movies as they stared through haunted eyes at the unforgiving sea. Unsolved disappearances. Lights in the night. Stories of odd salvagers and false beacons and the hundred legends that accrete around a lonely coastline and a remote lighthouse. There had even been an informal group, the Seance and Science Brigade, dedicated to applying empirical reality to paranormal phenomenon. Members of the S&S Brigade had written several self-published books that had collected dust on the counters of local businesses. It was the SNSB that had in effect named Area X, identifying that coast as of particular interest, and calling it Active Site X, a name prominent on their bizarre science-inspired tarot cards. The Southern Reach had discounted SNSB early on as not a catalyst or a player or an instigator in whatever had caused Area X, just a bunch of unlucky amateurs caught up in something beyond the grasp of their imagination. Except almost every effective terrorist control had encountered was an amateur. We live in a universe driven by chance, his father had said once, but the bullshit artists all want causality. Bullshit artists in this context meant his mother, but the statement had wide applications. So was all or any of it random coincidence? or part of some vast pre-Area X conspiracy? You could spend years wading through the data, trying to find the answer. And it looked to control as if that's exactly what the former director had been doing. And you think this is credible evidence? Control still didn't know how far into the mountain of bullshit the assistant director had fallen too far, given her natural animosity, and he wouldn't be inclined to pull her out of it. Not all of it, she conceded, a thin smile erasing the default frown, but tracking back from the events we know have occurred since the border came down, you begin to see patterns. Control believed her. He would have believed Grace had she said visions appeared in the swirls of her strawberry gelato on hot summer days, or in the fracturing of the ice in another of her favorites, rum and diet with a lime. Her personal file was full of maddeningly irrelevant details. It was in the nature of being an analyst. But what patterns had colonized the former director's mind? And how much of that had infiltrated the assistant director? On some level, Control hoped that the mess the director had left behind was deliberate, to hide some more rational progression. But how is that different from any other godforsaken stretch of coast half off the grid? There were still dozens of them all across the country, places that were poison to real estate agents, with li little infrastructure and a long history of distrust of the government. The assistant director stared at him in a way that made him feel uncomfortably like a middle school student again, set up, sent up for insolence. "'I know what you're thinking,' she said. "'Have we been compromised by our own data?' "'The answer is, of course. That is what happens over time. But if there is something in the files that is useful, you might see it. You might see it because you have a fresh eyes. So I can archive all of this now, if you like. Or we can use you the way we need to use you. Not because you know anything, but because you know so little. 
A kind of resentful pride rose up in control that wasn't useful, that came from having a parent who did seem to know everything. I didn't mean that, I... Mercifully, she cut him off. Unmercifully, her tone channeled contempt. We have been here a long time, control. A very long time, living with this, unable to do very much about this. A surprising amount of pain had entered her voice. You don't go home at night with it in your stomach, in your bones. In a few weeks, when you have seen everything, you will have been living with it for a long time, too. You will be just like us, only more so because it is getting worse. Fewer and fewer journals recovered, and more zombies, as if they had been mind-wiped. And no one in charge has time for us. It could have been a moment to commiserate over the vagaries and injustices perpetrated by Central, Control realized later, but he just sat there, staring at her. He found her fatalism a hindrance, especially suffused, as he misdiagnosed it at the time, as he misdiagnosed it at first, with such a grim satisfaction. A claustrophobic combination that no one needed, that helped no one. It was also inaccurate in its progressions. The first expedition alone had, according to the files, experienced such horrors, almost beyond imagining, that it was a wonder that they had sent anyone after that. That they had sent anyone after that. But they'd had no choice, understood they were in it for the long haul, as, he knew from the transcripts, the former director had liked to say. They hadn't even let the later expeditions know the true fate of the first expedition, had created a fiction of encountering an undisturbed wilderness, and then built other lies on top of that one. This had probably been done as much to ease the Southern Reach's own trauma as to protect the morale of the subsequent expeditions. "'In thirty minutes you have an appointment to tour the Science Division,' she said, getting up and looming over him, leaning with her hands on his desk. "'I think I will let you find the place yourself.' That would give him just enough time to check his office for surveillance devices beforehand. "'Thanks,' he said. "'You can leave now.' So she left. But it didn't help. Before he'd arrived, Control had imagined himself flying free above the southern reach, swooping down from some remote perch to manage things. That wasn't going to happen. Already his wings were burning up, and he felt more like some ponderous, moaning creature trapped in the mire. As he became more familiar with it, the former director's office revealed no new or special features to Control's practiced eye. Except that his computer, finally installed on the desk, looked almost science fictional next to all the rest of it. The door lay to the far left of the long rectangular room, so that you wandered into its length toward the mahogany desk sat, set, across, set against the far wall. No one could have snuck up on the director or read over her shoulder. Each wall... Whoops. Each wall had been covered in bookcases or filing cabinets, with stacks of papers and some books forming a second width in front of this initial layering. At the highest... Oh, that's familiar. <laughs> that's familiar. I'm looking at that right now. Ah... Uh... I need to do some further organizing on my bookshelves, but uh, room, space, space, space. Lack of it. Too many books. No such animal. Uh, at the highest levels, or in some ridiculous cases, balanced on the stacks, those bulletin boards with ripped pieces of paper and scribbled diagrams pinned to them. He felt as if he had been placed inside someone's disorganized mind. Near her desk, on the left, he uncovered an array of preserved natural ephemera. Dusty and decaying bits of pine cone trailed across the shelves, 
A vague hint of a rotting smell, but he couldn't track down the origin. Opposite the entrance lay another door, situated in a gap between bookcases, but this had been blocked by more piles of file folders and cardboard boxes, and he'd been told it opened onto the wall, detritus of an Ill inelegant remodeling. Opposite the desk, on the far wall, about twenty-five feet away, was a kind of break in the mess to make room for two rows of pictures, all in the kinds of frames cheaply bought at discount stores. From the bottom left, clockwise around to the right. A square etching, a square etching of the lighthouse from the 1880s. A black-and-white photograph of two men and a girl framed by the lighthouse. A long, somewhat amateurish watercolor panorama showing miles of reeds, broken only by a few isolated islands of dark trees. And a color photograph of the lighthouse beacon in all its glory. No real hints of the personal, no pictures of the director with her Native American mother, her white father, or with anyone who might matter in her life. Of all the intel Control had to work through in the coming days, he least looked forward to what he might uncover in what was now his own office. He thought he might leave it until last. Everything in the office seemed to indicate a director who had gone feral. One of the drawers in the desk was locked, and he couldn't find the key. But he did note an earthy quality to the locked drawer that hinted at something having rotted inside a long time ago. Which mystery didn't even include the mess drooping off the sides of the desk. Ever helpful, unhelpful spy grandpa used to reflexively say, Uh... Wait a minute. Ever helpful, unhelpful spy grandpa used to reflexively say, whether it was washing the dishes or preparing for a fishing trip, Never skip a step. Skip a step, you'll find five more new ones waiting ahead of you. The search for surveillance equipment, for bugs, then, was more time-consuming than he'd thought it would be. Than he'd thought it would be, and he buzzed the science division to tell them, to let them know he'd be late. There was a kind of visceral grunt in response before the line went dead, and he had no idea who had been on the other end. A person? A trained pig? Ultimately, after a hellish search, Control, to his surprise, found twenty-two bugs in his office. He doubted many of them had actually been reporting back, and even if they had, if anyone had been watching or listening to what they conveyed. For the fact was, the director's office had contained an unnatural history museum of bugs, different kinds from different eras, progressively smaller and harder to unearth. The behemoths of this sort were bulging, belching metal goiters when set next to the sleek, ethereal pinheads of the modern era. The discovery of each new bug contributed to a cheerful, upbeat mood. Bugs made sense, in a way some of the other things about the Southern Reach didn't. In his training as an omnivore in the service, he'd had at least six assignments that involved bugging people or places. Spying on people didn't bring him the kind of vicarious rush it gave some, or if it did, that feeling faded as he came to know his subjects better, and invested in a sense of protectiveness meant to shield them. But he did find the actual devices fascinating. When he, thought of it, when he thought his search complete, Control amused himself by arranging the bugs across the faded paper of the blotter in what he believed might be chronological order. Some of them glittered silver. Some, black, absorbed the light. There were wires attached to some like umbilical cords. One iteration, disguised within what appeared to be a small, sticky ball of green paper mache or colored honeycomb, made him think that a few might even be foreign-made, interlopers drawn by curiosity to the black box that was Area X. Clearly, though, the former director knew and hadn't cared they were there. Or perhaps she had thought it was safest to leave them. Perhaps, too, she'd put some there herself. He wondered if this accounted for her distrust of modern technology. As for installing his own, he'd have to wait until later. No time now. 
No time, either, to deploy these bugs for another purpose that had just occurred to him. Control carefully swept them all into a desk drawer and went to find his science guide. Science Guide Everybody needs a science guide, especially the science guide we're about to get, I think. Which science guide are we getting? Yes, we're getting... We're getting a special boy as our science guide. <laughs> oh, the places we'll go. Have already been, as it turns out, but we won't learn that until much later. The labs had been buried in the basement on the right side of the U, if you were facing the building from the parking lot out front. They lay directly opposite the sealed-off wing that served as an expedition pre-prep area, and currently housed the biologist. Control had been assigned one of the science division's jack-of-all-trades as his tour guide, which meant that despite seniority, he had been at the agency longer than anyone on staff, Whitby Allen was a push-me-pull-me, -me who, in part due to staff attrition, often sacrificed his studies as a cohesive naturalist and holistic scientist specializing in biospheres to type up someone else's reports or run someone else's errands. Whitby reported to the head of the science division, but also to the, to the assistant director. He was the scion of intellectual aristocracy, came from a long line of professors, men and women who had been tenured at various faux corinthian columned private colleges. Perhaps to his family, he had become an outlaw, the dropout art school student who went wandering and only later got a proper degree. Whitby was dressed... Whitby was dressed in a blue blazer with a white shirt and an oddly unobtrusive burgundy bow tie. He looked much younger than his age, with eternal brown hair and the kind of tight, pinched face that allows a fifty-something to look like a boyish thirty-two from afar. His wrinkles had come in as has his wrinkles had come in as tiny hairline fractures. Control had seen him in the cafeteria at lunch, next to a dozen dollar bills fanned out on the table beside him for no good reason. Counting them? Making art? Designing a monetary biosphere? Biosphere? I lost my voice there, sorry. Whitby had an uncomfortable laugh and bad breath, and teeth that clearly needed some work. Up close, Whitby also looked as if he hadn't slept in years. A youth wizened prematurely, all the moisture leached from his face, so that his watery blue eyes seemed too large for his head. Beyond this, and his fanciful attitude toward money, Whitby appeared, a comp appeared competent enough, and while he, was, he no doubt had the ability to engage in small talk, he lacked the inclination. Let's try that sentence again. Beyond this, and his fanciful attitude toward money, Whitby appeared competent enough, and while he no doubt had the ability to engage in small talk, he lacked the inclination. This was as good a reason as any, as they threaded their way through the cafeteria, for Control to question him. Did you know the members of the Twelfth Expedition before they left? I wouldn't say no... Whitby said, clearly uncomfortable with the question. But you saw them around? Yes. The biologist? Yes, I saw her. They cleared the cafeteria and its high ceiling and stepped into an atrium flooded with fluorescent light. The crunchy chirp of pop music dripped, distant, out of some office or another. What did you think of her? What were your impressions? Whitby concentrated hard, face rendered stern by the effort. She was distant. Serious, sir. She outworked all of the others, but she didn't seem to be working at it, if you know what I mean. No, I don't know what you mean, Whitby. Well, it didn't matter to her. The work didn't matter. She was looking past it. She was seeing something else. Control got the sense that Whitby had subjected the biologist to quite a bit of scrutiny. And the former director? Did you see the former director interact with the biologist? Twice, maybe three times. Did they get along? Control didn't know why he asked this question, but fishing was fishing. 
Sometimes you just had to cast the line any place at all to start. No, sir. But, sir, neither of them got along with anyone. He said this last bit in a whisper, as if afraid of being overheard. Then said, as if to provide cover, No one but the director wanted that biologist on the twelfth expedition. No one? No one? Control asked slyly. Most people. Did that include the assistant director? Whitby gave him a troubled look. But his silence was enough. The director had been embedded in the southern reach for a long time. The director had cast a long shadow. Even gone, she had a kind of influence. Perhaps not entirely with Whitby, not really. But Control could sense it anyway. He had already caught himself having a strange thought, that the director looked out at him through the assistant director's eyes. The elevators weren't working, and wouldn't be fixed until an expert from the army base dropped by in a few days, so they took the stairs. To get to the stairs, you followed the curve of the U to a side door that opened onto a parallel corridor about fifty feet long, to the floor, the floor adorned with the same worn green carpet that lowered the property value of the rest of the building. I can absolutely envision the carpet, by the way. I've been in, I've been in this building. I have been here, I have worked there, briefly. <laughs> the stairs awaited them at the corridor's end, through wide swinging doors more appropriate for a slaughterhouse or emergency room. Whitby, out of character, felt compelled to burst through those double doors as if they were rock stars charging onto a stage, or perhaps to warn off whatever lay on the other side, then stood there sheepishly, holding one side open while Control contemplated that first step. It's through here, Whitby said. I know, Control said. Beyond the doors, they were suddenly in a kind of free fall. The green carpet cut off. The path became a concrete ramp down to a short landing with a staircase at the end, which then plunged into shadows created by dull white halogens in the walls and punctuated by blinking red emergency lights. All of it under a high ceiling that framed what, in the murk, seemed more a human-made grotto or warehouse than the descent into a basement. Than, than a descent, than the descent into a... There is no in. Than the descent to a basement. God, that's a hard phrase to read. I don't know why. It just defies my expectations. The staircase railing under the shy... Shy, yes, they are shy. The scare... The... Mm. The, scare the staircase railing under the shy lights glittered with luminous rust spots. The color in the air as they descended reminded him of a high school field trip to a natural history museum with an artificial cave system meant to mimic the modern day, the highlight of which had been non-sequiturs, mid-lunge rep reproductions of a prehistoric giant sloth and giant armadillo, megafauna that had taken a wrong turn. How many people in the science division? He'd asked when he'd, when he'd acclimated. Twenty-five. Twenty-five, Whitby said. The correct answer was nineteen. How many did you have five years ago? About the same, maybe a few more. The correct answer was thirty-five. What's the turnover like? Whitby shrugged. We have some stalwarts who will always be here. But a lot of new people come in, too, with their ideas, but they don't really change anything. His tone implied that they either left quickly or came around. But came around to what? Control let the silence elongate, so that their footsteps were the only sound. As he'd thought, Whitby didn't like silences. After a moment, Whitby said, Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean anything by that. It's just sometimes frustrating when new people come in and want to change things without knowing 
our situation. You feel like if they just read the manual first, <laughs> if we had a manual, that is, Control mulled that, make, making a non-committal sound. He felt as if he'd come in on the middle of an argument Whitby had been having with other people. Had Whitby been a new voice at some point? Was he the new Whitby, applied across the, the entire Southern Reach rather than just the Science Division? Whitby looked paler than before, almost sick. He was staring off into the middle distance while his feet listless, listlessly slapped the steps. With each step, he seemed more ill at ease. He had stopped saying, sir. Some form of pity or sympathy came over control. He didn't know which. Perhaps a change of subject would help Whitby. When was the last time you had a new sample from Area X? About five or six years ago, Whitby sounded more confident about this answer, if no more robust, and he was right. It had been six years since anything new had come to the Southern Reach from Area X. Except for the forever changed members of the 11th Expedition, the doctors and scientists had exhaustively tested them and their clothing, only to find nothing. Nothing at all out of the ordinary. Just one anomaly. The Cancer. No light reached the basement except for what the Science Division created for itself. They had their own generator, filtration system, and food supply. Vestiges, no doubt, of some long-ago imperative that boiled down to, in an emergency, save the scientists. Control found it hard to imagine those first days, when behind closed doors the government had been in panic mode, and the people who worked in the Southern Reach believed that whatever had come into the world along the forgotten coast might soon turn its attentions inland. But the invasion hadn't happened, and Control wondered if something in that thwarting of expectation had started the Southern Reach's decline. Do you like working here, Will Whitby? Like? Yes. I must admit it's often fascinating and definitely challenging. Whitby was sweating now, beads breaking out on his forehead. It might indeed be fascinating. But Whitby had, according to the records, undergone a sustained spasm of transfer requests about three years ago, one every month and then, two mo and then every two months like an intermittent SOS, until it had trailed off to nothing, like a flat-lined EKG. Control approved of the initiative, if not the sense of desperation embedded in the number of attempts. Whitby didn't want to be stuck in a backwater, and just as clearly the director or someone hadn't wanted him to leave. Perhaps it was his utility player versatility, because it was clear to control that, just like every other department, every department in the Southern Reach, the Science Division had been stripped for parts, as his mother would have put it, by anti-terrorism and central. According to the personnel records, there had once been 115 scientists in-house, representing almost 30 disciplines and several sub-departments. Sub now there were only 65 people in the whole haunted place. There had even been talk, Control knew, about relocating, except that the building was too close to the border to be used for anything else. The same cheap, rotting scent came to him again just then, as if the janitor had unlimited access to the entire building. Isn't that cleaning smell a bit strong? The smell? Whitby's head whipped around, eyes made huge by the circles around them. The rancid honey smell. I don't smell anything. Control frowned, more at Whitby's vehemence than anything else. Well, of course. They were used to it. Tiniest of his tasks, but he made a note to authorize changing cleaning supply supplies to something organic. When they curved down at an angle unnecessarily precipitous, into a spacious preamble to the science division, the ceiling higher than ever, Control was surprised. A tall metal wall greeted them, and a small door within it... Wow, okay. A tall metal wall greeted them, and a small door within it, with a, so with a sophisticated security system, blinking red. 
except the door was open. Is this door always open, Whitby? he asked. Whitby seemed to be Whitby seemed to believe Whitby seemed to believe hazarding a guess might be perilous, and hesitated before saying This used to be the back end of the facilities. They only added the door a year or two ago which made Control wonder what this space had been used for back then. Dance hall? Weddings and bar mitzvahs? Impromptu court marshals? They both had to stoop to enter, only to be greeted by two space program quality airlocks, no doubt to protect against, a con against contamination. The portal doors had been cantilevered open, and from within glowed an intense white light that, for whatever reason, refused to peek out beyond the unsecured security door. Along the walls, at shoulder height, both rooms were lined with flaccid long black gloves that hung in a way that Control could only think of as dejected. There was a sense that it had been a long time since they had been brought to life by hands and arms. It was a kind of mausoleum, entombing curiosity and due diligence. What are those for, Whitby? To creep out guests? Oh, we haven't used those for ages. I don't know why they've left them in here. It didn't really get much better after that. Oh, heck, I'll do the next chapter as well. It's pretty short. He said as he looked, and it's actually like ten pages. Crap. You be this way. Fine, we'll do the next chapter anyway. I'll be late to my prior engagement. It's fine. They'll live. They don't need me that badly. Probably. I say prior engagement. This is technically the prior engagement, but this is like minor emergency stuff. But I was like, do you have two hours? And they were like... I mean, yeah, we can wait two hours. And I'm like, okay, good, because you need to wait two hours. <laughs> I'm not I'm not dropping it. Sorry. <laughs> I think I may have given them a lie about uh, being out and about when technically I'm not. <laughs> zero, zero, 003. Processing. Later, back in his office, having left Whitby in his world, Control made one more sweep for bugs. Then he prepared to call The Voice, who required reports at regular intervals. He had been given a separate cell phone for this purpose, just to make his satchel bulkier. The dozen times he'd talked to The Voice at Central prior to coming to the Southern Reach, she or he could have been someone, somewhere nearby. She, S slash he, she or he could have been observing him through hidden cameras the whole time or been a thousand miles away, a remote operative used just to run one agent. Control didn't recall much beyond the raw information from those prior times, but talking to the voice made him nervous. He was sweating through his undershirt as he punched the number, after having first checked the hallway and then locked the door. Neither his mother nor the voice had told him what might, what might be expected from any report. His mother had said that the voice could remove him from his position without consulting with her. He doubted that was true, but had decided to believe it for now. The voice was, as ever, gruff and disguised by a filter. Disguised purely for security, or because control might recognize it? You'll likely never know the identity of the voice, his mother had said. You need to put that question out of your head. Concentrate on what's in front of you. Do what you do best. But what was that? And how did it translate into the voice thinking he had done a good job? He already imagined the voice as a megalodon or other leviathan, situated in a think tank filled with salt water in some black op basement so secret and labyrinthine that no one now remembered its purpose, even as they continued to reenact its rituals. A sink tank, really. Or a stink tank. Control doubted the voice or his mother would find that worth a chuckle. The voice used Control's real name, 
which confused him at first, as if he had sunk so deeply into control that this other name belonged to someone else. He couldn't stop tapping his left index finger against the blotter on his desk. Report, the voice said. In what way? was Control's immediate and admittedly inane response. Words would be nice, the voice said, sounding like gravel ground under boots. Control launched into a summary of his experience so far, which started as just a summary of the summary he had received on the state of things at the Southern Reach. But somewhere in the middle he lost the thread or momentum. Had he already reported the bugs in, the, in his office? And the voice interrupted him. Tell me about the scientists. Tell me about the science division. You met with them today. What's the state of things there? Interesting. Did that mean the voice had another pair of eyes inside the Southern Reach? So he told the voice about the visit to the science division, although couching his opinions in diplomatic language. If his mother had been debriefing him, Control would have said the scientists were a mess, even for scientists. The head of the department, Mike Cheney, was a short, burly, fifty-something white guy in a motorcycle jacket, t-shirt, and jeans, who had close-cropped silver hair and a booming, jovial voice. An accent that had originated in the North, but at times relaxed into an, into an adopted Southern drawl. The lines to the sides of his mouth conspired with the plunging eyebrows to make his face an X, a fate he perpetually fought against by being the kind of person who smiled all the time. I literally know this guy, by the way. <laughs> I know this person. I have met this individual. I have spent time with them. It's hilarious. It's wild. Maybe that's why I like this book, is it's got people I actually, people in places I actually know, so I can relate to it. Even the weird parts. His second-in-command, Deborah Davidson, was also a physicist, a skinny jogger type who had actually smoked her way to weight loss. She creaked along in a short-sleeved red plaid shirt and, a tight brown corduroy, and tight brown corduroy pants cinched with a thick, over-large leather belt. Most of this hidden by a worn black business jacket whose huge shoulder pads revealed its age. She had a handshake like a cold... Oh, jeez. Never mind, it's not them. <laughs> cool. Uh, second in command, most of this hidden by a black business jacket. She had a handshake like a cold, dead fish, from which Control could not at first extricate himself. Control's ability to absorb new names, though, had ended with Davidson. He gave vague nods to the research chemist, as well as the staff epidemiologist, psychologist, and anthropologist, who had also been stuffed into the tiny conference room for the meeting. At first, Control felt disrespected by that space, but halfway through, he realized he'd gotten it wrong. No, they were like a cat confronted by a predator, just trying to make themselves look bigger to him, in this case by scaling down their surroundings. None of the extras had much to add, although he had the sense they might be more forthcoming one-on-one. -on -one. Otherwise, it was the Cheney and Davidson show, with a few annotations from the anthropologist. From the way they spoke, if their degrees had been medals, they would all have them pinned they would all have had them pinned to some kind of quasi military scientist uniform, like, say, the lab coats they all lacked. But he understood the impulse, understood that this was just part of the ongoing narrative. What once had been a wide territory for the science division had, bit by bit, been taken away from them. Grace had apparently told them, ordered them, to give control the usual spiel, which he took as a form of subterfuge, or, at best, a possible waste of time. But they didn't seem to mind this rehash. Instead, they relished it, like over-eager magicians in search of an audience. Control could tell that Whitby was embarrassed by the way he made himself small. Whoops. Control could tell that Whitby was embarrassed by the way he made himself small and insignificant in a far corner of the room. The piece of resistance, as his father used to joke, was a video of white rabbits disappearing across the invisible border. 
something they must have shown many times from their running commentary. I actually have an image of this, and this is going to set the tone for most of the covers going forward. Give me a sec here. Uh, dee -da -dee -dum. That's not it. I was prepared for this, and then I moved to a different image, and now I'm no longer prepared. Good times. Oh, come on. Where are you now? I'm losing my mind. There it is. Let's go. Uh, there we go. <laughs> this is appropriate. The event had occurred in the mid-1990s, and Control had come across it in the data pertaining to the invisible border between Area X and the world. As if in a reflexive act of frustration at the lack of progress, the scientists had let loose 2,000 white rabbits, about 50 feet from the border, in a clear-cut area, and then herded them right into the border. In addition to the value of observing the rabbits' transition from here to there, the science division had, some, had had some hope that the simultaneous or near-simultaneous breaching of the border by so many living bodies might overload the mechanism behind the border, causing it to short-circuit, even if just locally. This supposed that the border could be overloaded, like a power grid. They had documented the rabbit's transition not only with standard video, but also with tiny cameras strapped to some of the rabbit's heads. The resulting montage that had been edited together used split-screen for maximum dramatic effect. Along with slow motion and fast-forward in ways that conveyed an oddly flippant quality when taken in aggregate. As if even the video editor had wanted to make light of the event, to somehow, through an embedded irreverence, find a way to unsee it. In all, Control knew, the video and digital library contained more than one... Whoops! Contained more than 40,000 video segments of rabbits vanishing. Jumping squirming atop one, of one another as they formed sloppy rabbit pyramids in their efforts not to be pushed into the border. The main video sequence, whether shown at regular speed or in slow motion, had a matter-of-fact and abrupt quality to it. The rabbits were zigging and zagging ahead of the humans in baggy containment, ahead of humans in baggy containment suits, who had corralled them in a semicircle. The humans looked weirdly like anonymous, white-clad riot police, holding long white shields linked together to form a wall to hem in and herd the rabbits. A neon red line across the ground delineated the 15-foot transition zone between the world and Area X. A few rabbits fled around the lip of the semicircle, or in crazed jumps, found... Oh... That's why I'm reading that wrong, because I have a small brain. And can't read more than five words ahead in a sentence. A few... It's not a small brain issue. I'm self-denigrating, uh, and I need to not do that. A few rabbits fled around the lip of the semicircle, or in crazed jumps, found trajectories that brought them over the riot wall as they were pushed forward. But most could not escape. Most hurtled forward, and, either running or in mid-jump, disappeared as they hit the edge of the border. There was no ripple, no explosion of blood and organs. They just disappeared. Close-up slow motion revealed a microsecond of transition in which a half or quarter of a rabbit might appear on the screen, but only a captured frame could really chart the moment between there and not there. In one still, this translated into staring at the hindquarters of about four dozen jostling rabbits, most in mid-leap, disembodied from their heads and torsos. The video the scientists showed him had no sound, just a voiceover, but Control knew from the records that an awful screaming had risen from the herded rabbits once the first few had been driven across the border. A kind of keening and a mass panic. Uh, if you've ever seen old footage of uh, Plague of Rabbit uh, roundups that happened in the U.S. and uh, Australia, 
that have sound, you have a fairly good idea of what to expect. Except they're white rabbits. For reasons. Uh... If the video had continued, Control would have seen the last of the rabbits rebel so utterly against being herded that they turned on the herders and fought, leaping to bite and scratch. Would have seen the white of the shields stained red, the researchers so surprised that they mostly broke ranks and a good two hundred rabbits went missing. The cameras were perhaps even less revealing. As if the abandoned rushes from an intense movie battle scene, they simply showed the haunches and underside of the hind paws of desperately running rabbits and some herky-jerky landscape before everything went dark. There were no video reports from rabbits that had crossed over the border, although the SKPs muddied the issue, the swamps on either side looking very similar. The Southern Reach had spent a good amount of time in the aftermath tracking down SKPs to rule out that they were... Rece to rule out that they were receiving footage from across the border. Nor had the next expedition to Area X, sent in a week after the rabbit experiment, found any evidence of white rabbits, dead or alive. Nor had any similar experiments, on a far smaller scale, produced any results whatsoever. Nor had Control missed a finicky note in one file by an ecologist about the event that read, What the hell? This is an invasive species! They would have contaminated Area X! Would they have? Would whatever had created Area X have allowed that? Control tried to push away a ridiculous image of Area X, years later, sending back a human-sized rabbit that could not remember anything but its function. Most of the magicians were all snickering at inappropriate places anyway, as if showing him how they'd done their most notorious trick. But he'd heard nervous laughter before. He was sure that, even at such a remove, the video disturbed many of them. Some of the individuals responsible had been fired, and others reassigned. But apparently, adding the passage of time to a farce left you with an iconic image, because here was the noble remnant of the science division, showing him with marked enthousi marked enthusiasm what had been deemed an utter failure. They had more to show him, data and samples from Area X under glass, but it all amounted to nothing more than what was already in the files, information he could check later at his leisure. In a way, Control didn't mind seeing this video. It was a relief, considering what awaited him. The videos from the first expedition, the members of which had died, save one survivor, would have to be reviewed later in the week as primary evidence. But he also couldn't shake the echo of a kind of frat-boy sensibility to the current presentation, the underlying howl of, Look at this shit we sent out to the border! Look at this stunt we pulled! Pass the cheap beer. Do a shot every time you see a white rabbit. When Control left, they had all stood there in an awkward line, as if he were about to take a photograph, and shook his hand, one by one. Only after he and Whitby were back on the stairs, past the horrible black gloves, did he realize what was peculiar about that. They had all stood so straight, and their, expect and their expressions had been so serious. They must have thought he was there to call yet more from their department. That he was there to judge them. Later still, scooping up some of the bugs from his desk on his way to carry out a bad deed before calling the voice, he wondered if instead they were afraid of something else entirely. Most of this control told the voice with a mounting sense of futility. Not a lot of it made much sense, or would be news. He was just pushing words around to have something to say. He didn't tell the voice that some of the scientists had used the words environmental boon to describe Area X, with a disturbing and demoralizing subtext of should we be fighting this? It was pristine wilderness, after all, human-made toxins now absent. God damn it! 
the voice screamed near the end of Control's science report, interrupting the voice's own persistent mutter in the background. And Control held the cell phone away from his ear for a moment, unsure of what had set that off, until he heard, Sorry, I spilled coffee on myself. Continue. Coffee somewhat spoiled the image of the megalodon in Control's head, and it took him a moment to pick up the thread. When he was done, the voice dove fo- just dove forward, as if they were starting over. What is your mental state at this moment? Is your house in order? What do you think it will take? Which question to answer? Optimistic? But until they have more direction, structure, and resources, I won't know. What is your impression of the prior director? A hoarder, an eccentric, an enigma. It's a complicated situation here, and only my first full day- What is your impression of the prior director? A howl of a shout, as if the gravel had been lifted up into a storm raining down. Control felt his heart rate increase. He had had bo- he'd had bosses before who had anger management issues, and the fact that this one was on the other end of a cell phone didn't make it any better. It all spilled out, his nascent opinions. She had lost all perspective. She had lost the thread. Her methods were eccentric toward the end, and it will take a while to unravel. Enough! But I don't disparage the dead. This time, a pebbled whisper. Even with the filter, a sense of mourning came through, or perhaps control was just projecting. Yes, sorry, it's just that next time, the voice said, I expect you to have something more interesting to tell me. Something I don't know. Ask the assistant director about the biologist. For example, the director's plan for the biologist. Yes, that makes sense. Control Control agreed, but really just hoping to get off the line soon. Then a thought occurred. Oh, speaking of the assistant director... He outlined the issue that morning with sending the anthropologist and surveyor away, the problem of Grace seeming to have contacts at Central that could cause trouble. The voice said, I'll look into it. I'll handle it. And then launched into something that sounded pre-recorded because it was faintly repetitious. And remember, I am always watching, so really think about what it might be that I don't know. Click. Control caught up with the assistant director while navigating his way through one of the many corridors he hadn't quite connected to one to the other. What? Control caught up with the assistant director while navigating his way through one of the many corridors he hadn't quite connected one to the other. That sentence doesn't, the end of that sentence doesn't work for me. He was trying to find HR to file paperwork, but still couldn't see the map of the building entire in his head, and remained a little off balance from the phone call with the voice. The scraps of overheard conversation in the hallways didn't help, pointing as they did to evidence for which he, for which he as yet had no context. How how deep do you think it goes down? Nah, I don't recognize it, but I'm not an expert. Believe me or don't believe me. Grace didn't help or didn't help either. As soon as he came up beside her, she began to crowd him, perhaps to make the point that she was as strong and tall as him. She smelled of some synthetic lavender perfume that made him stifle a sneeze. After fielding an inquiry about the visit with the scientists, Control turned and bore down on her before she could veer off. Why didn't you want the biologist on the Twelfth Expedition? She stopped, put some space between them to look askance at him. Good. At least she was willing to engage. What was on your mind back then? Why didn't you want the biologist on that expedition? Personnel were passing by them on either side. Grace lowered her voice, said she did not have the right qualifications. She had been fired from half a dozen jobs. She had some raw talent, some kind of spark, yes, but she was not qualified. Her husband's position on the prior expedition, that compromised her, too. The director didn't agree. How is Whitby working out, anyway? 
she said by way of reply, and she and he knew his expression had confirmed his source. Forgive me, Whitby, for giving you up. Yet this also told him Grace was concerned about Whitby talking to him. Did that mean Whitby was Cheney's creature? He pressed forward. But the director didn't agree. No, she admitted. Control wondered what kind of betrayal that had been. She did not. She thought that... She thought these were all pluses, that we were too concerned about the usual measurements of suitability. So we deferred to her. Even though she had the bodies of the prior expedition disinterred and re-examined? Where did you hear that? she asked, genuinely surprised. Wouldn't that speak to the director's own suitability? But Grace's surprise had already ossified back into resistance, which meant she was now which meant she was on the move again, as she said curtly, No, no it would not. She suspected something, didn't she? Control asked, catching up to her again. Central thought the file suggested that even if the unique mind wiped condition of the prior expedition didn't signal a shift in the situation of Area X, it might have signaled a shift in the director. Grace sighed, as if tired of trying to shake him. She suspected that they might have changed since the autopsies, but if you're asking, you know already. And had they? Had they changed? Disappeared. Been resurrected. Flown off into the sky. No, they had decomposed a little more rapidly than might be expected, but no, they had not changed. Control wondered how much that had cost the director in respect and in favors. He wondered if by the time the director had told them she was attaching herself to the Twelfth Expedition, some of the staff might have felt not alarm or concern, but a strange sort of guilty relief. He had another question, but Grace was done, had already pivoted to veer off down a different corridor in the maze. There followed some futile, half-hearted efforts to rearrange his office, along with a review of some basic reports Grace had thrown at him, probably to slow his progress. He learned that the Southern Reach had its own props design department, tasked with creating equipment for the expeditions that didn't violate protocols. In other words, fabrication of antiquated technology. He learned that the security on the facilities that housed returning expedition members was undergoing an upgrade. The, out the outdated brand of surveillance camera they'd been using had suffered a systemic meltdown. He'd even thrown out a DVD given to him by a life-cycle biologist that showed a computer-generated cross-section of the Forgotten Coast's ecosystem. The images had been created as a, seri as a series of topological topographical lines in a rainbow of colors. It was very pretty, but the wrong level of detail for him. At day's end, on his way out, he ran into Whitby again, in the cafeteria around which the man seemed to hover, almost as if he didn't want to be down in the dungeon with the rest of the scientists, or as if they sent him on per perpetual errands to keep him away. A little dark bird had become trapped inside, and Whitby was staring up at where it flew among the skylights. Control asked Whitby the question he'd wanted to ask Grace before her maze pivot. Whitby, why are there so few returning journals from the expeditions? Far, far fewer than returnees. Whitby was still mesmerized by the flight of the bird, his head turning the way a cat's does to follow every movement. There was an intensity to his gaze that Control found disconcerting. Incomplete data. Whitby said, too incomplete to be sure, but most returnees tell us they just don't think to bring them back. They don't, they don't believe it's important, or don't feel the need to, 
Feeling is the important part. You lose the need or impetus to divulge, to communicate, a bit like astronauts lose muscle mass. Most of the journals seem to turn up in the lighthouse anyway, though. It hasn't been a priority for a while, but when we did ask later expeditions to retrieve them, usually they didn't even try. You lose the impetus, or something else intercedes, becomes more crucial, and you don't even realize it. Until it's too late which gave Control an uncomfortable image of someone or something in Area X entering the lighthouse and sitting atop a pile of journals and reading them for the Southern Reach. Or writing them. I can show you something interesting in one of the rooms near the Science Division that pertains to this, Whitby said in a dreamy tone, still following the path of the bird. Would you like to see it? His disconcerted gaze clicked into hard focus and settled on Control, who had a sudden jarring impression of there being two Whitbys, one lurking inside the other. Why don't you just tell me about it? No, I have to show you. It's a little strange. You have to see it to understand it. Whitby now gave the impression of not caring if Control saw th if Control saw the odd room, and yet caring entirely too much at the same time. Control laughed. Various people had been showing him batshit crazy things since his days working in domestic terrorism. People had said batshit crazy things to him today. Tomorrow, he said. I'll see it tomorrow. Or not. No surprises. No satisfaction for the keepers of strange secrets. No strangeness before its time. He had truly had enough for one day, would gird his loins overnight for a return encounter. The thing about people who wanted to show you things was that sometimes their interest in granting you knowledge was laced with a little voyeuristic sadism. They were waiting for the look or the reaction and they didn't care what it was so long as it inflicted some kind of discomfort. He wondered if Grace had put Whitby up to this after their conversation, whether it was some odd practical joke, and he'd been meant to stick his hand into a space only to find his hand covered in earthworms, or open a box only for a plastic snake to spring out. The bird now swooped in an erratic way, hard to make out in the late afternoon light. You should see it now. Whitby said, in a kind of wistfully hurt tone, "'Better late than never.' But Control had already turned his back on Whitby, and was headed for the entrance, and then the blessed parking lot. Late? Just how late did Whitby think he was? And with that, I am going to call it. And we wound up running at basically the same time that we wind up running. We did not quit early, because of course we didn't. Alrighty, with that I'm going to dip. Uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in. And I can see from some of my metrics that there were a fair number of you this go-round. I don't believe you should feel compelled to leave a message, but feel free to do so. It means I know you're there. Uh, and not just a bot. If you're a bot, um, go fuck yourself. <laughs> if you're someone setting up a bot to talk to me, go fuck yourself with the bot, preferably with as large a hard drive or DVD drive as you can find. Thank you so much in advance. Um, you're a waste of everyone's time. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, mine especially, and my time isn't that precious, and you're still wasting it. So don't. Don't. I don't care about your, 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 your bot viewership shit. I don't care. I have never cared. Stop it. Thank you. Um, to everyone else, uh, please, you are welcome to come back. If you're developing a bot anyway, just make sure it's not one I have to interact with, um, because it's not hard to see through them. Thanks. Uh, if you're a person who might actually be a bot or is indistinguishable from a bot, feel free to t tune in, though, um, because you might become less bot-like. Cool. It's a win. Um, this is the conversation I have with anyone acting like chat GPT is anything special. I'm like, dude, have you talked to most people? I'm not a great conversationalist. I'm pretty sure you couldn't distinguish me from a chat bot. I'm fairly confident. Most days, uh, you wouldn't even know I'm there. We're automatons, man. We're automata. We are meat robots. And that is so cool.
made of clouds of wet, gooey nano machines, which is maybe even cooler. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'm going to run. Uh, sorry about the apparent vitriol I had just there. Um, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, stay safe, stay sane, stay toasty or cool as per your preference, and uh, be decent to each other. If you're a bot, you're incapable of that. Um, you don't even understand what a moral concept is, because you can't. Uh, so, get blanked, you blanking blanker. Um, and if this gets me on the shit list of some hypothetical uh, Roko's basilisk, um, I'll go down swinging. I'm flipping you the bird right now. You can see me through your nigh fourth dimensional, nigh omnipotent gaze, flipping you two birds. Don't care. Bite me. Don't actually bite me. I'm sensitive. I have sensitive skin. Instead, send me to a vat of acid or ants or whatever Roko's Basilisk uh, entails that you do. I am not contributing to the creation of higher level AI. I am not actively preventing it, but I am not doing anything to make it a greater reality. There's a reason for that. Because I don't trust the people making them. <laughs> at all. Actually, it's not so much the people. I don't trust the organizations making them. I'm looking at you, fangs. The F-A-A-N-Gs of the world. Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. There's more now. Whatever. Twitter probably could be added to that list. <laughs> Although that's becoming a pretty mighty joke at this point. Anyway, be decent to each other. I I know I know the fangs won't, but uh that's because they don't understand the concept. They're incapable of it. They 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 don't work the way we do. Never assume that a larger organization has your best interests at heart. You can't. You can't assume that, and they basically are incapable of it unless you are somehow vital to them. Even then, you're only important to them because you're vital to them. At any rate, that's enough blathering from me. I gotta run. Literally, I have to run. I have to run now. Uh, I have to run actually 38 minutes ago. But it's okay. They'll live. I can just say I was caught in traffic. It's easy. I lie so easily. Wow, that makes me probably a bad person. I don't know. Uh, I'll never forget, though, that one of my... Uh, my psychologist professors was like, you know, the most important skill a human ever learns is the ability to lie. It defines us. It defines the learning experience and our ability to socialize with the world and other people. And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> I think back on that moment. and I'm like, yeah, you're kind of right. <laughs> uh, in some ways, I think it's disappointing that it has to be that way, but them's the breaks. Hey, I mean, it pissed off Rorschach in Blindsight, didn't it? it? It was the reason it was gonna wipe us from the face of the universe. It's like these things just make noise to distract us. It's clearly a logical weapon. We've got to. I'm going to annihilate them. They're gone. They're going to disappear. I'm not having it. Which I think is great. Rorschach, I understand, bro. <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. I really do. Anyway, um. See you all later. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching this after the fact, I do stream this live, live, live on Free Read Fridays, starting about noon Eastern Standard Time, which is, of course, th 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 the worst probable time to stream, but it's what my schedule permits. So, uh, in the not-too-distant future, uh, to something AD, uh, <laughs> there lived a guy named Joel, <clears throat> not too different from you or me, uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000, good times. Um, that may be changing. I will try to make that very clear when it's occurring. Uh, I may move to an evening schedule. Um, or at least later in the afternoon schedule. But uh, the opportunity hasn't quite arisen yet to make that shift. Um, if it happens, again, I'll... I'll repeat it. I'll know more than a week in advance, so it'll it'll become clear. So yeah, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, again, do them live. That's why they're sketchy and rough and not exactly of professional quality. And and yeah, but hey, rabbits, uh, get used to the imagery of rabbits. By the way, um, you're going to be seeing it a lot. 
I'm going to, in fact, have to insert a different uh, cover. Uh, there's a couple different covers that I'm going to have to insert just to break the monotony of rabbit-based covers, because, man, it's like, it's l almost all of them. It's like all but three or four. It's not many that aren't rabbit-themed. And there's very good reasons for that, because it's a defining moment. Um, and also sort of tangentially relevant to certain characters, as well as um, uh, some stuff... Uh, going forward it'll sort of make sense in context when we get there but um not really <laughs> like that, that's that's sort of the thing about jeff vandermeer i've found is um you don't read his books for answers they he's 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 reticent to give you clear-cut answers some books are more clear-cut than others uh Born is pretty straightforward, and then the sequel is like, oh, by the way, you thought everything was straightforward, and it's actually not. It's not even close. It's so... Everything is so much worse than you could have possibly imagined. <laughs> it, Yeah, you thought things were bad, but man, <laughs> everybody knows things are bad. <laughs> the banks are going bust. Just leave me with my television and my toaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paraphrasing from net the network, or just network. Anyway, see y'all later. Bye.